Okay. So I'm a hydrologist, so I work uh, with water. People say that, you know, water, fire don't <laughs> get along. So let's uh, look at uh, you know, how it goes. And uh, in the previous session, we had a three really interesting talk um, vegetation response to fire management. And uh, I'm particularly interested and uh, also relevant to my talk uh, was the utilization of fire on oak, juniper woodland. In my talk, I will kind of uh, um, show you how the vegetation will change in when fire is absent, you know, in the cross timber. and. Uh, so I will quickly just talk about what is cross timber and uh, you know what is reed cedar and uh, what encroachment is. Actually we heard a really new word is juni juniperization, right? I think <laughs> that's a really good one. And then my main focus will be the hydrologic impact of this and uh, at the end as the session means I will talk about some aggressive management, a case study we have from, you know, we did in Oklahoma. So I know before start, I make sure I have get these slides. So the result that I will present are a collective uh, effort of numerous uh, collaborator, researcher, and the grant student and postdoc in the past 15 years. I would also make sure to thank the funding agencies, in particular USGS support back in 2009, which jumpstart all the effort today. And uh, I would also would like to thank, uh, you know, Dr. Michael Stambo. You know, he invited me to this meeting for someone who don't have very much <laughs> fire experience. <laughs> so, and uh, finally, I would also thank the National Science Foundation, EBSCO project, which provided the funding for me to come to this meeting. And uh, with that, I will quickly to talk about the cross timber. So, the cross timber is not something new to most of you here in the audience. And the cross timber is a ecoregion. It is geographically across the north, a uh, very south part of the Kansas, and a, a big chunk of the middle of the Oklahoma, and the north part of the Texas. And you can see um, the this area is about eight million hectares, and the the yellow portion actually we call it a metropolitan. And I think Bill in the morning did a very good uh, you know illustration about how important that you know population and the metropolitan. Here I just put it Oklahoma and Tulsa and this picture, and uh, why? Because the population is growing pretty fast. And with more people, the demand, the demand of water. And this is a region which is not having that much water resources. And then because, uh, you know, the reason is the low relief and, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, climate is pretty variable. You got a drought occur pretty often, even this year. You know, I'm a fisherman, I go to the lake and there's no water. We sort of probably the density of fish is higher, but <laughs> that's, that's not how it's working. So, because low relief and our reservoir is fed by mostly by informal and intermittent streams. And uh, one of the other things I want to point out first is like uh, our study set is underlined by sandstone and some other probably underlined by limestone, which may have different impact in terms of groundwater recharge, which we'll touch a little bit later on. Vegetation. So this is in ecoregion 29, and the called the Central Oklahoma and you know Texas uh, plains. So forest and grassland is in this transition, and we have the prairie and oak woodland, uh, uh, you know mosaic, and the oak woodland used to be quite open, but everybody know here knows it is get much denser and primarily by a process you know called you know the encroachment or densification or mystification um, and the 
cross timber is a mosaic of a grassland and oak woodland. So in the absence of the fire, the, uh, the grass portion, it is have a quite a significant increase in the uh, uh, juniper. If you do not do anything in this grassland, give them 30, 40 years, they can form a closed canopy. And uh, then they are closed in this entire landscape from outside, but in the woodland, the juniper actually be able to grow in an understory, occupy the middle or you know, you know, middle story and close up inside. So this will transition the landscape into a almost a close the woodland, give them time. And uh, here I want to show you some of the, 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 the results about uh, you know we have done. But before that, I will see what you know you will heard a lot of Eastern cedar or reed cedar in this talk. But Eastern cedar often shown into just the code reed cedar. It is not reed, nor it is a true cedar. It is a juniper. You know, scientifically we call it the juniper virginiana. So if you look at this. Takes us a tree planting guide. <laughs> Remember, it's planting guide, and it is said it is uh, juniper. It is a uh, you know I can probably can't see very well. It's like a, a evergreen, mid size. You know, grows under moderate water use, and so it is a pretty uh, you know pretty you know drought resistance. So. If you look at what happened in Oklahoma in the last, uh, you know, I think we have the, the, the encroachment start just, you know, before 1980, but we only have the data since 1980s because the Long City 5 is available at that time. So the encroachment started in, you know, so they increased at the rate about 8% per year by canopy. And the, in year 2010, we have about you know, 1,236 kilo, square kilometers covered by the juniper you know, during that time. And uh, the reed and uh, the spatial scale of reed cedar encroachment into the cross timber or the oak woodland, it's a our challenge to detect use remote sensing. And to overcome this, we actually did a in situ measurement in a few pieces of the past of the uh, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs land. And uh, the oak recruit, you know, actually declined since like in 1950s. And in the meantime, the reed cedar in particular and other fire in torrent, you know, requests started to increase then. And uh, actually, we used the tree ring and found actually the fire in torrent more mesic species, like, uh, you know, um, mostly is. Uh, um, the um, I think uh, there, there are few species like Armas, Kaya, and the Sautis. They actually have a greater growth rates than you know Reseder, and Reseder have greater growth rates than the oak. And uh, with that, you know, we are starting to get a really you know kind of dense woodland. So you would see you know why care so what. And why we should care about the research encroachment? So there are many studies actually showed, and that uh, you know, if you have a landscape, open landscape, turn into a much more dense the woodland, you are starting to lose some very important, you know, ecosystem services, particular livestock grazing opportunity, and uh, wildlife habitat, particularly for those grassland and the savanna species. And uh, of course, you will lose some other recreation opportunity. First, people here in the audience, you may know, the risk of a wildfire. And this is going to be a very big nice picture if that occurred in this uh, urban and this suburban, uh, you know, fringe. I mean, the truth is one wow, my dean's house almost get burned. <laughs> the fire, you see that one. So, however, there's more and more worry about the change of hydrology, particular water resource due to this. And uh, there was not that much, you know, directly evidence or experiment started, you know, in the watershed started to show whether that happened or not. So in my research or in this talk, I were going to answer two questions, which is one is 
What is the impact of registered encroachment on water availability? If there is an impact where flow return, if the cedar is removed, and if we are doing so, how about the soil erosion? And uh, to address two questions, you know, we conducted a paired watershed study and the cross timber expand range near Stillwater, Oklahoma. And um, so the cross timber uh, expand range is a uh, general, you know, well drained with the soil about one meter above the sandstone. And uh, Use this watershed uh, study. We trying to measure every individual component of water cycle, and then also some of the change in the hydraulic property. And then I will quickly going through some of the results we have during the last 10-15 years. So one of the easy to understand but usually overlooked impact is the kind of interception. Our measurement actually shows that a evergreen dense red cedar canopy can result in over 30% of any precipitation being lost period to the canopy interception. This rate of loss it is comparatively higher than other vegetation cover type like a grass or oak woodland. So one of the most important water flux in a you know, water control system would be the transpiration. Our study actually found that juniper actually be able to transpire year round except a few days it's under zero temperature. And uh, at average, the cedar actually probably can transpire 24 liter of water per day. This number is not particularly high compared with some other tree. However, when you have a big, big stance density, they are capable to transpire every single drop of water, the late rainfall, so in a hot and dry climate. One thing we actually found out is, if you have the juniper encroach into your oak woodland, and there is a synergistic effect. In other words, is you know a juniper oak mixture stands can transpire more water than pure juniper woodland or pure oak woodland, assuming the same kind of base area. So that's that's something you know think about. If we have a dramatic increase of juniper in woodland, what will happen for water? So um, transpired water has to come from from soil right so when we observed you know the soil water content in the different layer of the soil as you see in this picture which is the the, the blue one it is under the juniper and the black is under the the the, the uh, grassland you know in the compared watershed in general you will have a lower water content under juniper woodland if you add them together as the water storage in the entire soil profile as you can see on the bottom one you have uh, quite a few soil water stores in this soil profile and at the given time and most importantly the there is a less frequent saturation condition under that uh, you know woodland now with soil water then we say you know how about the ground reach how about the water flux in the subsoil and the substrate so this is a little bit uh, more complicated you know figure showing you the uh, you know soil uh, water flux in zero to nine mi mini mi uh, nine meter and uh, if you just focus on the panel a which it is showing your conductivity you know just to take that as a water you know available uh, water content just in a different way but that one is the baseline in other words we measure the conductivity which is affected by the soil property and water content it is different for a lot of reasons however if we are measuring them continuously repeatedly and we look at the differences which is panel B and the change got to be water content because so property don't change very quickly and you can see the color from the the green color it is not change, nothing changing during that I say like from the the upper is in June middle and July and the bottom in the, in the August 
So when the color changing from a gray to pink to the dark blue means there's increase of water content. So if you scan this picture on the left side, and you can see there are during that three months due with 164 millimeter rainfall, we see the flux in the grassland, it's kind of like a you know, downwards movement. You see the same thing on the right side under the oak woodland. But we do not have evidence showing the water flux increase in the middle, which is the juniper encroached woodland, particularly on the, 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 you know, the, the juniper woodland. We actually see the decrease of the downward movement. In other words, you know, encroachment may not improve your groundwater recharge in this system in particular way. So, you know, those are just a screenshot of three months. So if you want to look at groundwater recharge potential, usually you were doing something like, a, you know, cross a decade level. So in this case, we actually measure the water level in this, uh, you know, in the, you know, uh, the perch uh, groundwater table, we, we actually see lower level under the juniper woodland. And then we use the chloride, uh, you know, mass balance, and then we estimate the, the potentially the recharge rate under the grassland. We actually have about nine millimeters per year, compared with about 0.3 millimeters per year under the woodland. In other words, actually the conversion to the woodland result in reduction of the groundwater recharge potential. So. And uh, finally, for this water balance, one of the probably most important for our system is the impact of our, on runoff. I mean, runoff I means overland flow plus some subsurface you know, flow, the shallow subsurface flow. You can the upper panel, it is the monthly precipitation depths. The middle panel, it is the water depths or water storage, which I show you in the previous uh, you know, uh, figure. And the bottom is the runoff depths on the monthly step. So if you can see that, it would be there is a reduced, not only in the events of runoff under Juniper Woodland, but also the depths in that given month. So all this evidence indicates water availability will decrease with red cell encroachment compared with the grassland. I would imagine the same would apply if you are starting to have the oak woodland becoming more dense. So then and you know, before I move on, I'll make sure there's, I have to address these caveats. So our system is underlined by my, you know, uh, sandstone, and we also have a quite a substantial source, like one meter. There are a lot of evidence showing that if you have the soil substrates is limestone or have very shallow soil, the change in the groundwater portion might be different. Okay, just uh, just uh, this is something you know not in my system. But then now this session about aggressive, <laughs> so I would say you know the second question we will flow return if the reserve is removed. If so, how about the soil erosion? And uh, so, during the time constraint, I will use this illustration to briefly outline the, uh, the management time, you know, the period from 2010 to the summer of 2015, which is served as a calibration phase. Some of the results I presented to you were collected during that period of time. In other words, nothing, nothing is applied. And it, in July 2015, all the cedar in two of the water heat were cut and, uh, and mulched, you know, after they, they, they live on site for about six months, <laughs> you know, directly, and then the whole away from the sides. And then we need one watershed, leave them alone, don't do anything. But the other one, we actually starting to use herbicide to clean all those grasses and to plant switchgrass because it, some of you may remember there was like a biofuel thing going on a few <laughs> years back. And then 
the switchgrass actually were established in 2017 and it grew really well. So we call from 2017 to, you know, now we're still working that as the you know, restored grassland, switch across the grassland, by the way. So here, I will show you what's the response, you know, in terms of the runoff, which is one of the big components in the system. So if you look at this figure, the, the, the green, which J means juniper woodland, J dash RP is juniper turned into, re, you know, restore prayer, right? And the juniper dash SG is juniper turned into switchgrass. If you look at the calibration phase, the runoff actually are low. However, relatively speaking, the juniper, the G, actually have a little higher than the other two. But since 2015, when the juniper were removed, look at the G, P, RP and GSG actually is reversed. They have much, much higher runoff from the, from the, from the watershed. And even in 2018, when the grassland where we established, actually the um, switchgrass have a very high productivity. You still see this return of this runoff in those two watersheds. So we kind of think about this. Uh, actually, the good news is like uh, juniper. We can aggressively cut them off, clear cut, and get some of the hydraulic function back. But the question is like you know how much soil erosion you may have during the process. So before during the calibration, the, run, the the sedimentation from those juniper woodland actually is not very high. It's less than 0.1 ton hectare per year. And uh, when we cut the juniper and leave them on site, didn't change very much. We got a 0.2 ton hectare per year. But in the year, we mulch them and pull them off the site we started to see some of the response about 1.1 ton for that restore prayer but the other one we have applied herbicide up to 13.2 ton per year people say 132 ton wow but to put that in context it is the average you may have for this cropping system but this is one time you know one post so good news is once this two water is established, their sedimentation rate, it is actually lower than that control one, which have not done anything. So now, summer up. So really cedar tree are rapidly encroaching into the grass and the and the oak woodland in the cross timber. And the least in the north part of the, the cross timber where we I work. And the vegetation transition and the county close up results in the alteration of water hydrologic function and water prevention, at least in our system. And the mechanical removal is effective in restoring the hydrologic function and recuperating of the water for maximum use. That means water getting into the reservoir and in the stream. But the cost can be high and the watershed is actually susceptible to reinfestation. Give them some, I can tell you the restore prayer we have, you got some cedar is like, uh, like uh, as to as me now after those years. So now, so here's uh, some of the some of suggestion, you know, just from my perspective, it's like probably some uh, proactive management might be something consider is like, before these things get in there, keep them out. <laughs> so I think bring the fire back and uh, keeping the cedar from establishing itself in the system probably is the, the most aggressive management in my opinion. And it, once encroached, the perspiratory fire actually still be able to be effective until the cedar get too big. You know, in general, less than three meters tall, you'll be able to kill them using perspiratory fire. Of course, the bio must remove operation. If you manage that the hay or you manage that the biofuel, you can keep the cedar from the wood encroachment because you harvest them every year. They have no chance to grow big. But if once a close canopy is formed, 
that can remove plus fire may be required. But I think it's sure to talk about <laughs> you probably can burn them. But use crown fire to control mature red cedar canopy. Probably need a little bit more research. I, I just think about uh, how, uh, how you can do that if you are not in the miniature installation <laughs> to create them. So with that, I don't know if they have main time to have a question or not. Yes, I think we do have time for one question. Oh, one question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, 